in the book of Ephesians chapter number 6 I want to begin reading in verse number 10 finally my brethren be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil for we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Paul, in Ephesians chapter 6, as he was drawing his letter to a close, it appears when he begins in verse 10, finally, my brethren, be strong of the Lord, the power of his might, and so forth. It appears that he is trying to prepare the people at Ephesus for the days ahead. I want to use tonight for a text verse, verse number 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. I think all of us will agree that we're living in evil days. There have been much said in the last few weeks concerning a lot of the current events that are taking place. The ungodly movie that is being produced has had much publicity and much attention. Then the issue and the protest against abortion in the city of Atlanta has been on the news most every day. I heard on the TV the other day concerning the protest there at the abortion clinic that in spite of all the efforts to hinder and to stop and to slow down the business, I heard, uh, I assume, was probably one of the workers from the home or director of the uh, facility there say that in spite of all of that they were still managing to do 50 abortions a day. On and on and on I could go but for the sake of time I don't think I have to elaborate on a lot of things describing to you the days in which we live. We're living in evil days. Paul was trying to prepare the church of Ephesus for the days that they were facing. He was trying to tell them to put on the whole armor of God that they might be able to withstand in the evil day. And then he said, having done all to stand. I see the, I see the conditions and I see the things that are rapidly coming upon us and moving in upon us in this world. I see the boldness of Satan. I don't think you could be any bolder if you've read anything at all of the content of this uh, movie that's coming out. I don't think you can get much bolder or brazen or foolish, I guess would be a better word to say, or any anti-God than that. What concerns me and, is, and what has concerned me for the, the last several weeks is this is that we see all these things coming upon us and we're living in a day, as I shared this morning in the Sunday school class, that it's no longer popular to be a Bible-believing Christian anymore. It's no longer popular to be a Bible-believing preacher anymore. It's no longer popular to be a fundamentalist. I remember when I started out preaching 21 years ago that, uh, you know, that uh, I was a fundamental Bible-believing, Bible-preaching preacher. People respected you for that. They think you're nuts now if you believe the Bible. But it's not only preachers. They feel the same way about you. You see, a lot of people think that, that, I'm, that I'm some kind of religious fanatic and religious nut for what I preach and what I believe, and they look down on me as though you know, that, that I'm some kind of strange creature. But I want to tell you something. They think just as little of you for listening to me. Amen? As they do the preachers that are preaching. Now, the thing that I said concerns me about this 
is we see all of this thing, and, and folks, this thing is shaping up, and it's, you know, it's drawing, it's drawing near, and uh, we're confronted with, with all these things, and, and the battle is on. I mean, I said this morning at Sunday school, we're fixing to experience somewhat at least of the price the early church paid for being Bible-believing Christians and being believers and followers of Jesus Christ. If, if God permits this thing to continue, you and I are going to experience somewhat of the price they paid to be Christians in the early church. Now, the thing that concerns me is this. Are we really ready for this? When we think about the condition of of Christianity today, and we think of, if I, when I think about how far in the wrong direction that it seems that the church is being steered and influenced, and how far back we've slid from where we were 20 years ago when I first started, I really wonder, are we ready for what's coming upon us? <clears throat> are we really ready to contend with what's coming upon us. Now, as the, as the old saying goes, I believe we're fixing to reach the place where, you know, we're gonna, the, we're gonna, the men and the boys are gonna be separated. We're gonna find out who's real and who's just playing around. I believe we're swiftly approaching those days and it is coming upon us when we're gonna have to pay a price for being Christians. Now, I wanna share it with you tonight and I said I'm not gonna try to be all night and I, this message really could just go on and on but I want to I want to just kind of throw out four or five things at you tonight as brief as I can on some things that we need to do in order to get ready for these evil days that's upon us if we're going to count for God we're going to have to we're going to have to do some turning around and we're going to have to head back in the right direction a little bit as I said we've kind of drifted off target and drifted in the wrong direction. Now, I know that this is the summer months in which we're in right now, and there's probably not a worse time for a church and, and so forth to go through than during the summer months. People's gone on vacation and, you know, in and out, people's minds preoccupied and all of that, and I'm aware of that. But at the same time, my job as a pastor is to keep my finger on the spiritual pulse of this church. And I'm afraid that, that if we're not careful, it's going to be more than, than a summer slump. That, that we can reach a place sometimes where we go through a summer and instead of bouncing back, we just kind of get used to it. And that's kind of what's happened over the years, and, and we've lost some ground. But how are we going to be ready for the confrontation that is facing us? How are we going to be ready to face these, these last days in which we're living in? Well, let me just mention some things to you tonight. First of all, I think the first thing we need to do, if we're going to face these evil days and we're going to, we're going to be contestants in contending, with some of these things that are coming upon us and we're going to be overcomers rather than the overcome and we're going to be victors rather than the victims, first of all, we're going to have to realign our lives with the Word of God. We're going to have to have an authority over our lives that has the last say. Not so much what you think or I think, not so much, you know, opinions or a dime a dozen, as old saying goes, and opinions don't mean much. But there has to be a central authority that we all look to to govern our lives, to guide our lives, and to give us the final say and authority on the affairs of our life. And I believe tonight that, it, that it's time that we as Bible-believing Christians recognize how far we've drifted away from the foundation of truth that our Christianity is built upon and realign our lives with the Word of God. The safest, the safest thing that we can do in these days is line our lives up with the Word of God and do, thus saith the Word of God. You see, it's not so much a matter of hearing the Word of God in these days as it is heeding the Word of God. We hear, but we just don't heed the Word of God. Now, I think about, you know, uh, I think about the illustration that Brother Junior used here one time, and many of you know it, maybe a few of you that missed it, 
but it makes a tremendous point. And I'll mention it again tonight about the fella, you know, that, that, uh, that come in while the preacher was up preaching. And, he, and the preacher was up preaching. He looked in the back of the building. And the fella back there was, you know, he was coming in. And he was getting an arm full of coats and heading out the door with them. And while the preacher was up preaching, the preacher said, the fella back there in the back is still in your coats. And he stood there and preached. And he watched the fella come in, make three or four trips, and go out with an arm full of coats. And the preacher kept repeating it. He said, I tell you, there's a man back there that's, that's hauling off everybody's coat. He's taking your coat. He's stealing your coat. There he goes again. And out he goes with your coat. And so the preacher just kept on preaching. Everybody, the service is over. And everybody got back there. There wasn't a coat in the house. And, and everybody was so alarmed. And they said, where in the world's our coat? The thief preacher, didn't you see? When you was up there preaching, didn't you see somebody coming in here and hauling out all of our coat? He said, I sure did. He said, I told you four or five times. There's a man back there stealing your coats, hauling out your coats. They said, but we thought you was just preaching. We thought you was just preaching. You see, we hear the word of God, but we don't heed the word of God. There's a lot of times that the preacher gets up and he preaches his heart and his soul out and he tries his best to tell you what thus saith the Lord is. And a lot of times we feel like, well, he's just preaching. He must be talking to somebody else. Now, I want to tell you something tonight. If we are going to be able to face these days in which we live in, you're going to have to get something from the Word of God that's going to sustain you and give you the holy boldness that you need to stand up in the face of the devil and be counted for Jesus in these evil days in which we live. I just turned over there a few minutes ago in the Word of God and when, when, when uh, Elijah in his day, he lived an evil day. Ahab, the wickedest king, the Scripture said, but ever lived was alive in, in Elijah's day. And Elijah looked at Ahab and he said, Ahab, I want you to know that it's not going to rain till I tell it to. And I want to tell you, you talk about stirring up a hornet's nest. When he told Ahab, the meanest king that had ever lived, that it wasn't going to rain till he told it to rain, I want to tell you, the devil got stirred up and the devil got mad. But you know what the next thing you read in the scripture there in 1 Kings 17 is, And the word of the Lord came unto Elijah, saying, the word of the Lord came unto Elijah saying, Get up and go over there by the brook and hide thyself by the brook. If you read that story, there was three things that Elijah had in his life simply because he obeyed the Lord as the word of the Lord came unto him saying, First of all, he had the power of God in his life. He had the power of God in his life. He had the provisions of the Lord and he had the protection of the Lord. Ahab looked in every crook and cranny of the whole kingdom trying to find Elijah's life. He wanted to kill Elijah, but he couldn't find him, the scripture said. Why? God protected him. You know what I believe in these evil days in which we're living in? If we align our lives up with the word of God and listen to God and, and not only hear God but heed God, I believe God will give us spiritual power. He'll give us spiritual protection. He'll give us spiritual provisions. And he'll watch over us and see us through these evil days. But we're going to have to heed the word of God. We're going to have to heed the word of God. Well, I like to overdone it last Sunday night. <clears throat> but I, I feel that preaching spirit here again tonight. It's hard for me. I've tried to slow down since I, since I had to lay off for a month sick, and I've tried to slow down, but it's hard for me to let up. And I want the devil to know this tonight. And listen, I may have to, I may have to slow down sometime but I'm not intending to let up. Amen? And I love to preach when the preacher's here, and, I, and so I just think I'll preach a while tonight. Amen? But we need to line our lives up with the Word of God, and I believe there is a place of power and protection and provision for God's people when they listen to the Word of God and then become doers of the Word of God. So I think the first thing we need to do is line our lives up with the Word of God. 
Secondly, I think we need to reaffirm our commitment to the will of God. You know the most familiar statement I hear in these days from Christians is I used to. Preacher, I used to serve on the deacon board. Preacher, I, I used to teach Sunday school. Preacher, I used to sing in the choir. Preacher, I used to sing specials. Preacher, I used to be a witness. I used to be a soul winner. Used to is the most familiar word that I hear in these days in which we're living in. But you know what we need from God's people if we're going to face these days in which we're living in? We're going to have to reaffirm our commitment to the will of God. Whatever that it is, and get back to that place of commitment, Rather than living a life of broken vows, we're going to have to renew those vows and sell out to Jesus in these last days in which we're living. We need to reaffirm our commitment to the will of God. And not, not just say, I used to, but say, I'm going to, and I am. Whatever that it is, ever how little and insignificant, your place of service may be. We need to reaffirm our commitment to the will of God. Amen. Now I want to tell you something. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm as happy as a pig in sunshine in this place. I've enjoyed the last three years being your pastor about as much as anywhere I've ever been in 21 years out of four churches that I've pastored in 21 years. I, I mean, I, I'm just as happy as I can be. But you know what I have to do every once in a while? I have to remind the devil that I come down here to stay. I have to remind the devil that I didn't come down here on a temporary assignment, but that I come to stay. And I have to reaffirm my commitment to the will of God in this place. You know what you'll have to do? You'll have to reaffirm your commitment to the will of God in your life. If we're going to face these days, we're going to be ready for the things that's upon us. We're going to have to have some committed people in the ranks of God's army. The Bible said a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And some of you tonight, you know what you know what you need to do out of this service, and nothing else is accomplished out of this service. If I were to quit preaching right now, if I were to quit preaching right now and give an invitation in this service right now, you know what I believe with all my heart? That there's a number of people in this building tonight, if you did what God is telling you to do and what you know that you ought to do, that you ought to reaffirm your commitment to the will of God and not sit there and say, I used to, I used to, but I'm going to and I am by the grace of God. We need to reaffirm our commitment to the will of God. Broken vows. I've stood a lot of times in the hospital and I've seen people laying flat at their bed, laying flat at their back in a hospital bed Say, preacher, I want you to know I promised God if you'd let me get out of this place and God will give me my help back, I'm going to serve him. My life's going to count for him. I want you to know I'm going to get in church. I remember a man tonight, and my wife knows who I'm talking about, or she may not pick up exactly right away on who I'm talking about, but I know a fellow tonight, I visited him three times in the hospital on three different occasions, on three different instances, and on every occasion... I have that fella to reaffirm his commitment to the will of God. Preacher, I'm going to get back in church. And I'm going to serve God and I'm going to live for God. And, and I mean, God's really showed me this time. God is, God, I know why I'm here. God has allowed this to come to me in order to speak to me. And preacher, I, and he never, never did. He, he'd come out and fall right back in the same way. Right back in the same category. You know tonight it's dangerous to live a life of broken vows to God. I would say it's better not to ever make a vow than it is to make one break it. I'm thinking about a man tonight whom I used to be his pastor. And uh, his name was Larry. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't ever, I, I mean, he just never could get settled. And I tried to help him and I tried to talk with him. And I, I remember that, that he'd come to my house one day and told me that God had called him to preach. And he said, I've got to preach. And I said, well, if God's called you to preach, that's what you need to do. I said, you, need, you just need to make that commitment to the Lord. If God's calling you to preach, you need to preach. And I seen that same young man. He didn't follow through on that commitment. He got out of church again and didn't, didn't come to church. And I remember one time I got a call, and, 
Larry had had a serious automobile accident and uh, almost died. Stayed in the hospital about 12 or 13 days in a coma without regaining consciousness. Finally, he regained consciousness. And the doctor said if he lives, he'll never be more than a vegetable. He couldn't walk. He had brain damage. He couldn't talk. Do you know I seen that same young man God brought off of the deathbed from a broken vow. That same young man sat in our living room one day with tears run down his face and he couldn't talk plain. His tongue was, and he couldn't get his speech to, to talk right. And, he's, and I, I never felt so sorry for anybody in my life. And he sat there in the living room of my house. He'd come in on crutches. He couldn't walk, barely getting around. And that was months after the accident when he'd done that. He come in and he sat down there and tears run down his face. And he said, Preacher, I, I told the Lord that if he let me live, that I would preach for him. And I mean that I'm going to preach this time if God will let me live. And I sat there and listened to him talk, and I thought, Your time is past. Your time is past. You broke your vow to God, and you'll never preach now. And you know what? I've seen a miracle in that young man's life. I seen the day come when he tossed his crutches away. I seen the day come when he could speak as clear as this preacher is speaking right now. Just his, his voice, just as clear and crisp as it could be. But do you know what? After God brought him back from deathbed, restored his health, his balance, his brain damage back to him, giving his speech back, did you know that it wasn't long until Larry was gone again and was out of church? He broke his vow to God. And he would not preach what God told him to do after God had spared his life and worked a miracle. And the next phone call I got said, Preacher, did you hear about Larry last night? I said, No, I didn't hear about him. He said he had another automobile accident. He died suddenly. He said he was killed instantly. He said they said he never knew what hit him. You know, tonight, many a Christian, and there may be somebody sitting right here tonight, and I'm not trying to scare you or shake you up, but if that's what it takes to get you in the will of God, then I'll do it. It'd be better off for me to shake you up and scare you and get you in the will of God than to stand over you at a funeral somewhere or stand by your bedside in a hospital somewhere. I want to tell you something. Listen, serving God is the greatest privilege in all of this world. The evil days are upon us. In this world in which we live, God needs some frontline contestants in the battle that we're in. And we're living in a day when Christian after Christian after Christian is playing around with their Christianity and they backed up on their commitment to God and they're living a life of broken vows. We need to reaffirm our commitment to the will of God. Listen, if you're looking for a place to quit, you need to find a place to start over. Now I want to tell you a thing to do tonight. I don't care how tough it gets, and I don't care how discouraged you get. I'm human just like you are, and I get discouraged too. I, I face the same trials and the same problems and the same heartaches as you do, and it's discouraging sometimes. And I want to tell you I'd rather be in the will of God for my life than anything that I know. And if the old devil's talking, you just need to drive down a stake tonight, say, old devil... I'm committed to the will of God, and I intend to stay in the will of God. If he knocks you down, get up and go again. If he knocks you down, get up and go again. But don't let him have a victory in your life. Don't let him have a victory in your life. Sure, you're going to get discouraged. You're going to get discouraged. The devil's going to see to that. He, he wants you. He wants you to give up ship. He wants you to turn your back on God. And I want to tell you, the worst day you ever had with Jesus is better than a good day with the devil if you're here tonight and the devil's pulling at you and nudging at you you need to reaffirm your commitment to the will of God if you're here tonight and you used to teach you used to preach you used to be a deacon you used to sing whatever you used to do and you just kind of sat down and found a place to relax you need to reaffirm your commitment to the will of God reaffirm your commitment to the will of God well, let me move on. I said I wasn't going to preach all night. We need, in the third place tonight, to recapture our enthusiasm about the work of God. 
We need to recapture our enthusiasm about the work of God. We need to get excited about Jesus. I'm doing tonight what I'd rather do than anything in this world, and that's preach. If there's anything I'd rather do than preach, I'd be doing it. I mean that, and if there's anything I'd rather do than preach, I ought to be doing it. I never did like to hear anybody do anything that got up and apologized and talked about how they hated to do it and how tough it was and how rough it was and, you know, and, and complained all, all the way through it. I never did like to hear nobody talk about God making them do anything. I don't tell you, God's not making me preach tonight. I'm not preaching because God's got a whip in his hand making me preach. I'm preaching tonight because God put a burden in my soul and gave me a vision and a call from God to preach the gospel. And I'm preaching the gospel tonight because I want to preach the gospel. The Lord put that want to and that desire in my heart. And we ought to get enthused about it. We ought to get enthused about it. Listen, I know. I said a moment ago, you get discouraged sometimes. You get, it's hard to stay up all the time. And we allow our feelings to creep in. And, and listen, to be honest with you tonight, physically, physically, I'm not too enthused. I'm tired. But spiritually, I feel good. I told old Brother Frank tonight, standing up here, we were talking. I said, I got one of them calls like policemen get, you know, sometimes. I got a call this morning about 3.30, and a lady on the other end of the line crying. She needed to be encouraged and needed some help. Have you ever got woke up 3.30 in the morning and tried to get spiritual? <laughs> That's kind of hard to do. And I sat up, up on the side of the bed and, you know, and tried to get, wait, tried to get awake and rub my eyes and, 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 and prayed under my breath for God to quicken this old sleepy head of mine and give me something to say to this lady that was in desperate need on the other end of the line. And I, I'm physically tired tonight, but I feel good spiritually. I feel like I'm about 75 physically instead of 42. But spiritually, I feel like I'm about 16. <laughs> Amen. And I'm just tickled to death about Jesus. We ought to recapture that enthusiasm. Listen, we get hindered by circumstances a lot of time. We allow circumstances just bog us down and chain us down. And we can't have victory and we can't get enthused. And, and listen, a lot of folks come to church on Sunday. They get up in the wrong set of circumstances and, and the devil throws something at them. Before they get to church, they're defeated all day about it. But I want to tell you something. I believe when you serve God, you can get up every once in a while. Instead of saying, good Lord, it's morning. You can get up and say, good morning, Lord. Thank you for another night of rest and letting me see the sun come up this morning. I've got a health and strength. I could be in the hospital or in the grave, but thank God I'm alive, and I've got the privilege to serve you. Amen? And recapture our enthusiasm. We, we get hindered by circumstance, and then a lot of times we get hurt. We're hindered by the circumstance, and then a lot of times we get hurt. Did you know I believe the devil uses hurt more than anything I know of to hinder people in the work of God? Do you, now listen, if you don't know it tonight, I'm going to tell you, every one of us in this building tonight are human. We're human. And every one of us was born with what you call feelings. And sometimes they're going to get hurt. Sometimes, you, sometimes you're going to be hurt. Sometimes somebody's going to rub you the wrong way. Sometimes somebody's going to hurt you. You know, I know people tonight that sat down on God for years. I know people that's walked away from the church and, and left for years because they got hurt. Now listen, it, it's hard to be in a battle without getting hurt. Have you ever heard of a battle without any wounded? No, we're in a battle tonight. And old devil's going to see to it that we get hurt sometimes. And if you ever give in to the, if you ever give in to circumstances, the devil will hinder you. He'll keep you south down. He'll south every ounce of joy you have out on circumstance. I know a lot of folks they're going to, they're going to just as soon as, but soon as don't ever get here, so they never do. I'm going to just as soon as, but don't ever get there. You know what? The devil knows you're addicted to circumstances. 
and he knows you cater to circumstances and so he'll see to it your circumstances are never just right never just right and then if you if you get your feelings hurt the old devil sees that listen you know what God's trying to teach you when you get your feelings hurt now you can believe this or you can pass it on but I want to tell you what God's doing in your life you know why God allows you to get your feelings hurt? He's trying to teach you forgiveness. Even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you, that we're to forgive one another. How do you learn how to forgive if you're never offended? You will never know the blessing of forgiving someone unless you're offended. They just some things that, that you have to learn by experience. Hurt. Don't, don't let the devil stop you with your hurt. Don't let the devil hinder you by the circumstances. Recapture that enthusiasm and don't let the devil sap your joy. Listen, the worst crime that we have in our day is the tragedy of dead churches. Just dried up and dead. The Philippines is talking this morning. He said, boy, we'd like to come to this church. Said, we like to come to a live church. And they got in on that revival we had back two or three months ago. And, uh, and they said, we like to come to a live church. We need some enthusiasm in the work of God. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. I'm not promoting fanaticism tonight. But I'll tell you what, I'm promoting people getting excited about Jesus. I'm promoting people getting enthused about the Lord. I think we need that in the, I mean, listen, we, we get up a lot of times. Have you, ever, have you ever met a salesman somewhere trying to sell you something? And he met you and he just looked like, you know, just looked like he was about to kill him to talk to you. Huh? I used to have a brother that worked for me when I was in business. I tried every way in the world to teach him how to be a salesman. He prejudged him when they come in the door and said, I didn't have any money anyway, he wasn't going to buy anything. I said, did you talk to that person? Did you try to sell him? Uh, no, I said, he wasn't going to buy anything anyway. I said, well, he didn't have no money. So we never could have got him financed. <laughs> he judged them before they got in the door, you know. I said, man, everybody walks through that door. It's a potential customer. If they, if they didn't need anything, they wouldn't be in here. Who wants to wait? I mean, listen, who, who likes to just go around and listen to a salesman talk for a hobby? I mean, I, I'd rather do anything than do that. I'd just I'd soon go to the dentist and hear one of them sales and put on one of them sales fields if I'm not interested in buying something. And I get so tired sometimes they call on the phone, you know, and they read off all this list of stuff, and you're on the phone, you're waiting on them to get their breath where you can tell them you're not interested, you know. But you meet, you meet somebody here with a long face, you know, and it looks like it's just a burden to them. And people come to church and, and you know, and, Everybody's sitting around with a long face. It looked like their religion's about got the best of them. I mean, you know, it's like about, they've just about stood as much of it as they can. And then they, they say, well, you know, I wonder why. They, folks don't get saved like they used to, do they? No, man, they feel like they're faring better than we are. They don't, you know, if it's going to make them worse, they ain't going to fool with it. <laughs> don't we need a little enthusiasm about the Lord? You say, preacher, you, you sound like you never... No, I have problems. I have problems. I have my discouragements, my disappointments, my defeats. I contend and have everything, the same thing you do. And I tell you what I do every Sunday morning when I get up, I try to get on my knees in that office over there and leave all of that over there and come through the doors of this place with a little joy in my soul. Well... I'm going to quit. I'm not going to get finished. Can I mention one more thing? We need to reassess our priorities about the worship of God. I long for the day when people will put worship back on their priority list. There's three steps that, we, that we've gone through. We're at the convenience stage now in this matter of worship. We started out, we started out with a, just a, I mean, a consuming hunger. 
You remember how it was when you first got saved? The hunger for God just consumed you. You couldn't wait till you got to church. I mean, boy, you just had a hunger for God. And, and I mean, you, you thought your preacher was the best preacher you ever, you, you just never had heard a preacher like him before. He was the best preacher that God ever called. Sure as the world. And a perfect one at that. And the church, man, you never heard such a choir singing in all your life. I mean, we got the best choir singing you'll ever hear anywhere. And the friendliest people. And I look forward to every Sunday. I mean, there's just something on the inside of me that eats and gnaws at me. I look forward to getting to church to be with my brothers and sisters in Christ. And there was a consuming hunger that called us to the table of the Lord. And we slide our feet up on the table and worship God with joy in our soul. But we drop from that stage of a consuming hunger. We drop down to step two, and that's conviction. And I'm going to tell you, the most miserable life you've ever lived is when you begin to live your Christian life solely by conviction. Well, the reason I go to church, I've got a conviction that you're supposed to go. And you get convicted if you don't go, and so you go out of conviction. I've just always been taught, and, and you know, that you're supposed to go to church when you go, when you go out of conviction. And you lose all your joy. You read your Bible out of conviction. And you, and you pray every night before you go to bed out of conviction. You go to church out of conviction, and your whole life is centered around conviction. You've done lost your joy, and you're living by conviction. And what your Christian life consists of is a list of rules, do's, and don'ts. And there's not an ounce of joy in it, just mechanical. Might I tell you something tonight without being rude, you might as well have stayed at home. You're never going to see God. You know what you're going to do? You're going to complain. Is that not so? You're going to complain instead of enjoy it. When you come out of conviction, you're going to find something wrong with everything. That perfect preacher is not perfect anymore. He don't preach like he used to preach. The choir don't sing like they used to sing. Sunday school teachers don't teach like they used to teach. People are not as friendly as they used to be. Isn't that not so? I mean, you you come in, you think of a half a dozen, half a dozen things, you know, wrong right off the bat, and it's conviction. Then it becomes a burden to you, and then it gets, then it gets to the place that drops down to stage number three, and that's the convenient stage. And so you just go when it's convenient. You've lost your conviction, and you just go when it's convenient. You know where we're at tonight in Christianity, and for the most part, a lot of Christians in that convenient stage. If they don't have anything else going, they'll go to church. I remember a time 20 years ago when I first started preaching. Boy, when you had a pretty day when the sun was shining, you could just look for a house to be full. People just pile in, you know, come to church, beautiful day. If it's raining, they'd stay at home. And preachers used to get up and preach, you know. I remember when I, I was preaching, kid preacher starting out, and I'd get up and preach, and I'd say, well, you know, it takes a whole river to get a Baptist into the church. It takes a few drops to get him out. I'm preaching on that. You know, things just kind of turned around the last 20 years. This is how far we've come. Now, if it's raining, you'll have a better crowd because they can't go anywhere else. If it's pretty, they'll go to the lake. Or they'll go to the mountains, or they'll go somewhere else. I mean, they're they often gone. You've got to have bad weather to have a good crowd in, in the average church anymore. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying it's convenient. It, we just go when it's convenient to us. I want to tell you something. This warfare that we're facing right now is going to consume us if we don't get back to some things that I've mentioned right here tonight. We're not going to be able to stand in the evil day. We're going to... We're going to be consumed. We're going to be overcome rather than the overcomers. We need to return out there to that field and witness. You know what Jesus said to pray in these last days? Pray that the Lord of the harvest, that he'd send forth laborers into the fields. Hold every head's bowed and every eye closed more quick.
Let me ask you something tonight. And I know for the last two or three weeks on Sunday night, I've preached pretty strong to the church. But I've just tried to share with you what I feel like God wanted me to share with you. And I said a moment ago, if I'd stop and give an imitation, that I believe that there's a number of people right here in this building that need to come tonight and be honest with God. Reaffirm your commitment to the work of God. We need to get back to that place where the house of God is a priority to us. It's a place where we draw our spiritual food and our strength. What is God speaking to you about tonight in your life? All I ask you to do is be honest. All I ask you to do is be honest. If God spoke to you tonight, you ought to respond. You ought to come. and Do business with God, whatever it is. If you'll do that, God will bless you for it. To not only hear, but to heed the Word of God. Remember what I said at the beginning. To hear and heed the Word of God is the assurance of God's power, protection, and provision upon our life.